I feel well whelmed. I feel challenged, but not overly stretched. I feel, I feel out of my comfort zone, but I feel like it's, it's, it's going somewhere, right? I don't feel stagnant. I don't feel bored. I don't feel, I don't feel uh, understimulated, but I also don't feel overstimulated, right? And so it's, it's that play with language that I, I always want to encourage because I think it, it can lead to something very fruitful. What do you think of that word? Well, well. Yes. Yeah. And I, I think it's so important because actually um, one description of burnout is when you when you move from, for example, um, being um, uh, driven to overdriven, being um, thoughtful to overthinking, being giving to overgiving. So I really think that, you know, where is that balance and what word allows us to, to be the things we want to be? Because, you know, I, I want to be someone who, who is a servant leader, who does give, but not to the point that um, I'm no longer able to. So yes, I think there's something in there about that that well or that that balance like that's what we want to basically communicate here we are welcome to another episode of green planet blue planet podcast i'm here today with dr jacqueline care uh, welcome jacqueline thank you so much for having me and happy new year to you yeah, happy new year, happy 2024. And I'm really excited to, you know, have have you on for the beginning of this year. It's the world is changing. Th things are things are, you know, um, changing everywhere, I think, over the last five years or so, even more so than ever. And yet again a new year. You know, what do people really need to consider starting a new year to make this one uh, a thriving year, no matter what kind of external change might happen? Right. And I agree, we're definitely in very uncertain times. And I think that's one thing that we can really start to think about embracing is um, a, a mindset um, that says, OK, let's experiment. There isn't an instruction manual. We haven't been through these types of experiences before, but we do know a lot about how change actually works from behavior change science. Um, from community advocacy, for example. So it, it's about how can we use some of those tools and strategies in this very new situation. So I think at first, if people can embrace that, that there isn't a, um, you know, a one size all or a silver bullet that's going to solve these issues. And as you know, each new thing comes in as we saw AI come in this last year. I mean, people are having to adapt to to change so quickly, and it's and it's exhausting. It can be stressful. Um, the feeling of uncertainty is very stressful. So it's about helping people get comfortable um, with you know, admitting what we don't know and um, being able to um, be more agile because of that. And, and for me, that comes from very much having this experimental mindset of saying, OK, what do we think is going to work? Why do we think it's going to work? Um, and also what's not working. So actually, that's one of my first steps. Most people are thinking about New Year's resolutions. What can I add? What can I do that's new, that's going to make a change? And we often go into those um, resolutions with um, poor understanding of how behavior change. So I can talk a little bit more about that. But usually what I'm suggesting is said because of this overwhelm we have is let's find out what's not working. Let's get employee feedback on that so we can really bring them in, engage them into this process. Let's take action on that because, again, employees are saying that we're not taking action when they give feedback, whereas if we're actually agreeing up front, we've got to get rid of some of the clutter. And even the U.S. Surgeon General said this to, to help with burnout. He said, first, we have to get rid of the stupid stuff. So that's what I um, really like to Take help people out what's think not through. working. Exactly. Yeah, that makes a lot of get sense, of right? I mean, first. In any, in any of our personal lives, but also, I guess, in any business I've ever worked with, this is a topic. It's like there are certain things that are being done a certain way. But then when you look a little closer, sometimes no one actually appreciates or agrees with that process. And it's just inherited from the past for whatever reason it may be. And, you know, maybe in, a, in you know, for you listening in, in, a, in your personal life, you have a parallel to that as well, where something is being done a certain way or you've done it a certain way or you know you always do it when you come home or you always do it on the weekend but what if you saved up that time and kicked out that one habit 
Do you think it's easier to get rid of a habit or to start a new habit, Jacqueline? Oh, that's such an interesting um, question because what I was going to share here is one way that I was able to get rid of a lot of my to-do list. So I think in terms of um, person, some habits like that are easier to get rid of. Let me give you the example where the, it doesn't work and then I'll, I'll, I'll describe a little bit the exercise I went through to take stuff off my list. So um if, for example, you're giving up chocolate or alcohol, right, <laughs> versus taking up meditation or taking up more fruits and vegetables in your diet. So you wanted to uh, adapt. You know, you're thinking about those two types of behaviors. I would say take on the, the meditation and or the fruits and vegetables rather than give up the chocolate. Because the problem is with something like chocolate and alcohol, every time we're thinking about not doing it, we're reminding ourselves of the thing we're trying to avoid. And it actually can become, you become even more obsessed with it in some ways. So that is a little bit more difficult. But in this situation of being, for example, in burnout that I went through and then trying to say, okay, I need to get things off my plate. What can I give up? But then it's gone. You don't then spend time um, thinking about it every day of it's gone. I'm not having that. Right. It, these are things you want to get rid of. And that when they're gone, like, you, you know, you're not getting all the, the wonderful chocolate advertising or whatever to remind you of them. So that's the, the difference in this situation. So one of the things that I started to do, because I was very much had this messaging to myself that I was a a bad mom, a bad wife, a bad colleague, a bad boss. And essentially, I had a coach who said to me, let's do a reality check on that. So she said, write down everything you do for everybody. So I wrote down everything I did. I got this in, you know, really huge list of things I did. And then she said, then, then basically, she said, so in reality, you're not bad. You're doing all these things. But what it made me also do was sort of go, oh, my goodness, I'm trying so hard. So I really took the time to say, look how hard you're trying. Please thank yourself for trying this. But then let's look at the, this list and say, oh, my goodness, there's no way I'm doing all this well. There's probably no way that everyone wants me to do all this. So then going through that list and really feeling in my gut, which are the things I love, which of the things don't make me feel good, which drain me, which are obligations that I've put on myself, but the others aren't expecting me to do. And then which really can I give up? And so that's what I had to do is go through that list and really get rid of stuff. And so that's the same thing that I really recommend that organizations go through that process. And again, do it collaboratively. You want your employees to be involved in this process because they're so often frustrated that they give feedback and you take no action. Now, if you're trying to do something new in an organization, you're not sure whether you can actually do the new thing. Whereas if you're actually saying, we want to get rid of things, your employees are, are, you're the informed users, you know the most about this, tell us what's not working, tell us what we can get rid of, be part of that decision making. And going forward, they're going to have much more um, buy-in for what is going to be um, adopted or just for the solutions that remain because they've been part of the process. So that's definitely what I, I recommend. Yeah, I like that. And thanks for the, the, the breakdown. Um, I want to I wanna ask a question to a TED Talk you gave a couple of years ago. And that's, you know, it was titled How to Stop Burnout Before It Starts. Do you want to walk us through this? I think you know, burnout is a real thing. Um, you know, most, most people hopefully never get to experience it, but there's something when we lack passion, when we lack purpose, or when we just do too much of something that, that can happen to all of us, right? How do you recommend to completely steer away from that on an individual level? I think as a society, we may be even burned out with the way our systems run us and the planet into a certain kind of corner, right? Um, do, you, do you mind touching on that kind of bigger meta picture yeah. and then weaving it back into the to how to how to stop it before it starts? Right, and actually, it, the meta picture is is the whole thing because when you stop something before it starts, basically that is prevention, right? And that's where I come from. My background: um, I've been a professor of public health for um, over two decades. So that's really where, where I came from is public health and understanding that in public health, 
and I describe it in my a TEDx talk as a um, like a baked Alaska. So if you think about it, we've got these layers. So at the bottom, you know, you might be the the cake. And basically, as an individual, there is things you can do, for example, to set boundaries, to ask for help that is going to help you. But then in a, a you also have to see well, what's the interaction with those around you. As a mum, I had to work out how to share the load with my family more, how to get more help for the home-based things. Then in that organizational level, what are the policies, procedures, the, the culture that enables you to, to be productive while you're at work? But then what are the social pressures that inhibit you from coming to work, ready to work? And so um, I'm not expecting workplaces to necessarily solve all these issues, but I do feel like there's an opportunity for them to take a role in this. Because when we think about public health, there are many inequalities that exist in society, for, particularly in the US, for example, there is, there is racism within the health system and there is poor access to care. So if you tell somebody as an employee, go get mental health therapy on your own. And if you're a colored employee, you may not, not be able to access a culturally appropriate mental health care. Whereas if in the workplace, you start to say, actually, as a workplace, we can create the conditions at work where we can support um, employees. And it's not that you're solving the problems people have outside of work. But for example, if that problem was they need a more flexible schedule, you can solve it. You can help to solve it. So I love this multi-level model because it helps us understand where we as individuals intersect with the world around us. It, particularly if we're an organization trying to understand um, our customers or our community, we've got to understand where they fit in the world and, and, and the struggles that they're having because of all these different um, levels. And then um, finally, when we think about these levels, it gives us this mindset of being able to have so many more options on the table to talk about. It, it really improves our compassion and understanding of the, the barriers people face. And then once we understand those, we can start to say, okay, how do we work to overcome those barriers with the, the tools and situations we have? Mm. So in terms of that in particular mm -hmm. for, for I was for just Bernard, about to ask, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of that in particular for for, for burnout and for me, um, you know, I I I have a also a focus on thinking about um parents and caregivers. So you're also doing a job, um, but you're also trying to um care for, for somebody else in your community or or within your family. Um, and so, again, that is about um, having flexible work habits. Um, that's about having the options to have um, parental leave and to get subsidized childcare support. Um, so those things are coming from the organization, but also it's about learning yourself how to set boundaries, how to ask for help, how to say no. And then in your family situation, that is learning about how to share that workload. And what actually happened in, in my family with discussions with, with my husband, a couple of things happened. One, I started to involve the family in all the decision making much more. And that way we did. We said, no, we don't need to decide about this. We don't even want to do it. Um, so that shared decision making within my family led to so much relief for me. And when the kids had the involvement in the decision making, they had much more buy in to making the solution work. Um, but also then it was recognizing that what I needed was to take a break from parenting when I could and to leave my husband to, to be at home, to be the dad he wanted to be without me being there and perhaps being critical of, of his style. Um, so that was a big insight um, for me. But then at the organizational level, it's this shift to understanding that even though we describe burnout as um, unmanaged chronic stress, it's not the person that's not managing their stress. Um, there may be some of that involved. That's why it's these levels are important. But it's where is that stress coming from? And the biggest problem is when people go away, like myself, and you, you go away and you get coaching and you take your time to sort of fix yourself if you want, you come back and you see 
I'm not the problem. The, the, the stress is coming from the workplace, from, from the workload, from the lack of recognition, lack of reward, lack of purpose and values, um, and lack of alignment with who you are and the purpose and values of your company or the people around you, and lack of fairness. So this also has a, a, an equity it, it you know um perspective to it because um like the first stage of 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 burnout in Freudenberger and North's burnout 12 stages the first stage is having to reprove yourself now you might have to do that because of the type of person you are but you also might have to do it if there are systems in place which means you're not being promoted because your boss it makes a decision on their own and, and that they have the biases that they have versus having objective criteria for promotion and a, a, a decision team. Um, so those things can help reduce bias. But that's why we burn out. Hmm. Yeah, there's, there's two things I, I want to tap in here in, in, in this. And, and one is, I think, you know, just to, you know, push back in this podcast episode a little bit to get more out of you. You said, and, and so you, you maybe leave an organization and you get this coaching support to kind of, you know, you said a quotation marks, fix yourself. I think that notion is almost in itself a big part of the challenge because there isn't really a brokenness that we have to fix. Right? It's more like there are holistically, well, there, there, there are patterns and systems that are not holistically supporting people in who they are. And so I don't personally believe anymore in this notion that we have to save the planet or fix ourselves because I think we're fundamentally unbroken and I think the planet is fund fundamentally safe and we, we can create a lot of havoc to the natural environment, to each other, to ourselves, right? And so um, my follow-up question here is, would you say all of it comes back to relationship, the relationship that we have to ourselves, the relationship we have to each other, the relationship we have to the natural world? Or do you think we can't really bring relationship and, and, and relationships in that sense into organizations or the workplace? Yeah, and I, I totally agree with you that, that, mm. that we shouldn't be thinking about fixing ourselves and and but unfortunately that is the 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 language and sometimes it even yeah. comes from within companies in terms of you may have a coaching program within a company and you help your employees learn some of the skills like setting boundaries for example um but then if they start to do that and realize okay nobody respects my boundaries i'm trying to say i want to work less hours or i'm not going to respond to emails or can we have fewer meetings and there's not an acceptance of that if you're a boss and you do actually have the power to say okay i'm going to work less then your employees are lost because they're like well when do we talk to them they're not here in the same times that they used to be so to me, this is what's so important is, is that it's collective change. Because anytime we want to set a boundary, where is the edge of it? It's in relation to somebody else who either can support us in that boundary or, or deny us that boundary or push back. And then there's that negotiation. So I, I absolutely agree that this, this is about um, relationships. But the way I see it is about how do we support each other to work the best together? And that's to me what, what culture is. And it's about these behaviors and social norms that we do every day. Um, but as we think about, you know, 2024 and moving into a new year, we so often focus on New Year's resolutions, for example. And then we do the same. We do like, okay, what, what can I do individually to like self-improve, into the new year and then we often do that on our own quietly because we've probably tried to do goals in the past failed so we're not going to get out there and say this is what i'm doing right so that there's that um way we do it all quietly on our own and that's actually what quiet quitting is too right so instead it's it's about us together saying okay we want to work learn to work together better together how can we do this together? So to say, look, I'm going to try these new things. Can you support me to do them? Can you um, 
Can you um, be an accountability partner when I need it? Will you try to do it with me too? Because if we're doing it together, it's better. And this is what we're lo losing is social learning. So research shows that social learning is the most effective type of learning because we have role models that we can um, aspire to be, that we can imitate. Um, we have reinforcement from the group to say, this is us doing the right thing. This is worth doing together. And also then um, we get, um, you know, we get feedback on how to correct if we're, if we're going off track. Um, so social learning, when we do it together, has much more impact for the group as a whole and for individuals within that group. Um, so that's definitely what, what I think is that if we do it collectively, we're going to be much more successful. We've got to move away from this individual and I agree that the fix it mentality. Yeah, no, it was quite apparent in the way you used it. I just really, I just really love that our language is evolving, right? We have to actually understand mm -hmm. that. Um, the language we use in order to describe those phenomena, it might not be the same language we would have used in the 60s. And it is continuously evolving, right? Or in 100 years ago or whenever. And that's both a natural phenomena as well as in a podcast specifically, that's what we're, that's what we're challenged with, right? It's like, can we find words and describe what actually is the pragmatic takeaway for, for each other to go to go all this way. And I know you've done so much research on it. Actually, I did want to make sure I mentioned this. You, you know, you're, you're one of the top 1% most cited scientists in the world. You've received um, really large funding in, in re research um, for individual organizational and community change. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you've what you found out and how that's evolved your work? Because it's fascinating. Right. And thank you for that opportunity. And maybe I can even just ask back to you as well, as we think about the wording we use, um, because I want people to think about behaviors, because behaviors are the things every day that we, we do. And people often talk about values, but it's very hard if bad values are not operationalized in behaviors. We also talk about something like employee engagement and say an engagement question on a survey might be, someone in the organization cares about you. But, but what does that look like? Do they have a wellness plan when you have a career plan? Um, are they asking about your personal life in one-to-ones each week? Um, you know, what does that, or do they give you flexibility to do your work? Like what shows that, that those, those concepts? Because the, to me, they're like further down, they're indicators, but they're not the behaviors we do every day. But as soon as I say the word behavior, people think of, individual change. So I'm trying to, you know, communicate collective behaviors, cultural behaviors. So if there's anything that you have that makes you sort of think, well, what would be a good word for those types of behaviors? Um, I'd appreciate that too. <laughs> yeah, I, I, let, me, let, me keep, let me keep thinking on this, but this is definitely... Keep thinking about you know, it, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with it because, you know, I grew up in, in the German language group, then moved out to, you know, as learn Spanish and Portuguese and then English. And, and so a lot of these patterns are very similar across different cultural groups, especially in the modern, more industrialized kind of workplace, right? And then there is a longing, uh, I think, in, in people's um, kind of process of finding themselves, of understanding who they truly are, of understanding that the world doesn't need to be run in a way that it kind of destroys um, both the, the natural world around us as well as like our social fabric, but could be run in a more regenerative kind of way of, of, of looking at who, who are the players, the, the stakeholders of any process, right? Once we reach that place, some of the language we use just doesn't really um, serve us as well anymore, right? And so I am positively speaking obsessed with it, with understanding what are these what are these, these new words we need to find to describe things? But I think it has to do with describing something that's actually happening, right? I'll give you an example. So right. if I were to use the word overwhelmed, right? Before I'm reaching burnout, I will be overwhelmed. And that already has a, a pretty negative rep because if, if you're saying I'm overwhelmed, it sounds like you might not be, or if I'm saying I'm overwhelmed, it might sound like I'm not... Um, intelligent enough or capable enough or on top of it enough or whatever it might be. But it might just be that juggling the responsibilities of life and also working 
uh, more than 40 hours, maybe more than 60 hours a week is just actually overwhelming because I can't take care of my kids or can't be a good husband or wife or I can't, uh, you know, walk the dog or whatever it might be, right? And so we also know the word underwhelmed, right? It's when something is underwhelming. Maybe you booked a very expensive experience and there is some service and the service is just underwhelming. It's like, I just paid thousands of dollars for this. I'm expecting something that wows me and it was underwhelming. A word we don't use though, and it's funny because in English it's kind of a, a quirky word, but would be well-whelmed, right? Like, mm-hmm. I feel well-whelmed. I feel challenged, but not overly stretched. <laughs> I, feel, I feel out of my comfort zone, but I feel like it's, it's, it's going somewhere, right? I don't feel stagnant. I don't feel bored. I don't feel, I don't feel uh, understimulated, but I also don't feel overstimulated, right? And so it's, it's that right. play with language that I, I always want to encourage because I think it, it can lead to something very fruitful. What do you think of that word? Well, well. Yes. Yeah. And I, I think it's so important because actually um, one description of burnout is when you when you move from, for example, um, being um, uh, driven to overdriven, being um, thoughtful to overthinking, being giving to overgiving. So I really think that, you know, where is that balance and what word allows us to to be the things we want to be? Because, you know, I want to be someone who, who is a servant leader, who does give, but not to the point that um, I'm no longer able to. So yes, I think there's something in there about that that well or that that balance. Like that's what we want to basically communicate that we're at a that are with yeah. So for me, thriving it, it, is that word. That's that's why I use it. Um, yeah. But let me tell you the little bit of the research background and its relationship to what we're talking today. So yeah. So. So um, I I did international um, studies um, around what are the things that that allow us to thrive in our lives, in our communities. So those studies were very much about individuals, about families, about where they lived um, and about the different countries. And then I really wanted to come back and, and to be able to say, well, um, how do we change those things? Like if, if so, so I had to learn about um, community advocacy. I had to learn a lot about um, politics as well. How how are policies made? How are decisions made? So the work that I did and, and got funded for was very much empowering local leaders to lead. Um, groups in their communities to teach them how to be leaders, for them to then lead groups of people in their communities to come together, and then for them as a group to be able to advocate the greater change in their community. And sometimes that was like totally building something new um, in their community. So that to me then is like long lasting permanent change. And that's really what Mm. I'm excited and interested in doing. So there's lots of things that I they learned about that process in terms of some of the groups that we might not think have a lot of power in these situations actually do. So, for example, what I discovered in that journey was that older adults were an exceptionally powerful group who basically had um, the attention of politicians because of being such consistent voters. And so I also learned about other organizations, for example, here in the U.S., the um, AARP, which is like one of the large retirement organizations, and the role they had in policies and politics. So um, I think it's so important to to learn about um, how we teach people to 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 coach other people and to bring people together. Um, that's definitely one of the skills that that I studied and mm. de- did research on. But also, how do we change decision makers? You know, we need data to get through the door quite often, but it's actually stories that engage us so much more with data. So when you think about data in the workplace yeah. now too, then, it, you know, without a story, you know, it, it, it doesn't lead us to make action. So it, it's like both are so important. Um, and so those, those are some of the things that, that I studied also kind of more specifically in the workplace around workplace wellness, for example, um, interventions um, to get people to um, use standing desks and interrupt the day more. Um, so things like that. So um, 
related to behaviors, but behaviors that basically could then um, cross into um, community action and actually changing policies and built environments. That's fascinating. You said something there about, you know, data is, it's, it's great to have, and it's really fundamental to see the patterns, right? Like this is one of the, one of the big hopes, I guess, with, with AI evolving. Um, I'll, I'll take one of those examples that made it really visible to me. But if we look at, if we zoom out on a really big city and we take all of the traffic pathways and we took all of the traffic lights and then we just let a highly intelligent quantum computer calculate for us what are more optimized flows for those roads and those traffic lights, very, very likely that computer could find out a better way to, to have more green light flows and less red light stops or just at the right place to slow people down where they're driving the fast or whatever. And it, it makes sense how fast the data would maybe be able to be used for something very useful, right? But you said it that for humans to understand data, we usually need a story, right? And podcasts are kind of a bit of story time as well, where, like we said a, a couple minutes ago, it's, it's so challenging not to use language that reminds us of like decades ago be, because we, we simply don't necessarily have that language. We need to evolve it together and it's not always easy. What are some of those stories that, that you like to share um, that, that help people get in touch with your, with your data and with your research even more? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, there's, there's so many. And, and really to just relate to the story you had about, say, AI and, and traffic flow. So, you know, one of the um, committees that I sat on um, in my prior work was in the regional transportation planning. So that, for example, changed when they actually brought public health into that space, right? When I first started, I remember sitting down with three colleagues saying, why aren't we in the room with these, these traffic planners, right? And then it did evolve over time and we got to be in this space, but they were still setting the agenda. So they'd ask us for data saying, what data should we be collecting? But they were focusing entirely on traffic data. And I said, I'm not going to respond to this request for what types of traffic data. I want to ask what are the pedestrian, what is the biking data that you need in this point, because this is what leads to a healthy community. And um, they didn't have the data. So then I was able to share data that I had been collecting with them because that had been my focus. So I think that's what we have to be really careful about is um, when we leave AI to discover patterns, what is already in the data in the, the first place. And so that is also um, kind of a story that, that I tell and share. It comes from a movie, but basically the movie was with Denzel Washington and essentially they had been having spy cameras go around and photograph um, tanks as part of this movie. And then they got into the situation where they're in a nighttime battle and, and the US tanks started firing on themselves because basically the system had learned that every enemy tank is in fact nighttime because they were taking all the spy pictures at nighttime. So, you know, th that's the kind of an example of how AI can just go rogue and go so wrong. So that's what I think about is one that's like unsupervised learning where you're not actually guiding the algorithm to learn it. Two, what is the data you're giving it? How valid is it? Where is it coming from? Where's the bias in the data to start with? Um, and then three, how can we keep testing it in the conditions that make sense? Because I actually developed a machine learning algorithm as part of my work to reduce the bias in um, pattern recognition of activity. And, and again, you have to understand that it, it's basically just working out the probability of something. So if the probability, for example, of bias in a meeting is, is very high, um, it could learn that that's the thing to do instead of saying, oh, actually, that's part of the problem and this is the thing we want to reduce. So um, I think, you know, that's so important. And, and so qualitative um, interviews, interviews of employees, that's the way to collect um, stories and, and even to share those stories on, within a platform, within an organization. And, you know, one of my podcast guests shared that, how they started to collect stories during COVID and actually share them of people struggling, people coping. Um, and that really changed um, 
you know, the, the, the engagement in their organization because we learned more about each other. We had more compassion and empathy for each other. Um, and we didn't think we were alone anymore. That's what I think podcasts are so important for too, that feeling of it's just me. Again, because we're stuck in that individual mindset, we then think not only am I broken, I'm the only one that's broken, right? And, yeah, and that's I'm what's so one. frustrating and sad because it's not true. Yeah, I'm I'm a hundred percent on the same page, and I think we we all go through this in different iterations as humans, right? This this feeling of um, being isolated or or not understood, and then emancipating over it, or kind of evolving away from it again, realizing no, actually, I I am, and and here's here's the proof, right? Maybe if you want to share a personal anecdote, when was that click in your life where you realized this is what I'm? You know, I said it earlier, like positively obsessed with or so passionate about that I am the right person to do this kind of research. I'm the right person to to just lean in, go forward and make it happen. Was there a moment? Was there like a, something you had to overcome? Like, how did that that step happen for you? Mm -hmm. So I feel very lucky, really, in my life that I, that I feel like I've had two paths to passion. So my first path was what I've talked about a little bit, this this path to um, building healthy communities and, and the research path that I had. And that was something I absolutely um, was was um, driven by, loved, but it became too much. I took on more and more leadership in that position. I was having kids, so it became overwhelming. And that's when I experienced my own burnout. And I was so devastated that I stepped away from that position. I did it because, um, you know, I had to do it for my own mental health and for also the, the safety of our family because I was experiencing you know, suicide ideation in that moment. And so it had really got to me so much that, you know, I was approaching the new year and saying, I'm not sure I can, you know, keep going. So, so um, in that process, I, I, you know, I took the decision to, to, to leave that career. And I was so sad that I'd lost my passion. But as I described, once I had spent all this time trying to work out what I could have done differently and then started to see, actually, there's, there, there's things like the maternal wall, which is basically women are not being promoted. There's the motherhood penalty where moms are being paid less than dads. When I started to see all these social barriers and organizational barriers that were in the way for, for women and particularly for for women of color, for example, then I started to say, okay, this is what I know how to do. I know how to help people create long-term culture change. I know how to develop culture habits in an organization to help with this. I understand how policies change and how we can actually make long-term change. Um, and really, so this new passion evolved as saying, you know, I want to build um, thriving you know, corporate cultures for all so that, you know, mums like me and mums with a lot less privilege than I do aren't, um, you know, and the dads too aren't, aren't experiencing, um, you know, burnout or suicide ideation because there's social expectations, um, you know, and because we've been set up for so long to just be, proving and proving and proving ourselves without um, the support to to actually um, have a fair pathway through this all. Mm. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And thanks for sharing the like, you know, the depth and the darkness of that moment as well, which I think is, you know, it's, it's something that needs to be addressed that, you know, we, not all of us go through that exact kind of um, despair, but many of us actually do, right? And so um, I think the the hardest part for the human journey or the human soul uh, is is to to feel and believe I'm all alone with this. And you said it before, there's there's so many reasons why why to why to realize that we're surrounded by others that can help us, surrounded by others that can kind of step into what I would call our human superpower, which is collaboration, right? Our ability to come together to be adaptive, to be in, in the moment, but to also have like 
to plan together. And so um, thanks for sharing that anecdote. I'd, I'd love to hear more, of course, if there's another story that's coming through. Um, in the meantime, I'll ask you a, a question and feel free to, to just share and keep sharing. But the question is, if you were to go back to your 15-year-old self, if we were to talk to the younger audience right now in this podcast, right? 15 to 20, somewhere there. What do you know today? You know, it could be one thing, could be three things that you kind of wish you could share to that younger part of yourself. And that's such a fascinating age you picked because um, one of my children, my son, is 15. And so I'm seeing so much about him that I can relate to. Um, I, he, he's um, such a hard worker and he's pushing himself so much. And um, so really what I'm trying to do, one is um, share with him when he struggles with something mentally. Say, yeah, me too. I, I have these struggles too. Not be afraid as a parent to say, I'm struggling too. Because I think sometimes we, we look at our parents and they seem to be, you know, doing it all so perfectly because they're, they're showing this, you know, veneer of everything's, you know, under control. And I think um, CEOs do the same. CEOs are stuck in their optimism bubble saying everything's great and people's realities are it's not great. Um, so that that sort of false positive, um, you know, so, sort of psychology doesn't help anybody who who's struggling and suffering. So that's definitely one thing that I, I um, you know, have, have worked um, to understand how I can use my example um, to to not frighten my kids, but to, to help them understand. Yet yeah, this is how we struggle. And these are the things that I, I want to teach them. Um, particularly is coping skills. So what are the things you can do when you're struggling to, to help yourself? But really a message that I'm, I'm very much finding I'm having to give my son, and I, I also you know, wished I had heard it or been told it, because again, you're not sure whether you're not hearing it, is that um, breaks and rest are going to make you more productive you're going to be more innovative and creative and you're going to have greater regeneration, for example, of your, of your muscles or whatever. If you're, you know, doing athletics or something, you know, the more rest you take. And I always try and give him examples because I have a, a, some friends and they're actually, you know, high level athletes. And over their careers, they have actually seen the science change and this sort of no pain, no gain, Arnold Schwarzenegger mentality has gone to actually what you're trying to do is optimize your workouts and optimize your rest. And actually the more time as an athlete you take rest and actually have, um, you know, massages and other things for your body, the, the better you perform. So I think um, we're moving into a, a, an understanding of performance that includes rest. Um, and again, I, I, I came from a background, um, you know, my father was um, and his family were very working class and he was very ambitious and working hard to provide all the things in life for his family. Um, and so that work ethic of work hard, I still value, but not without um, some some boundaries and some breaks built in because we're, we're fooling ourselves and we're being so egotistical, really, at the end of the day, if we think we can do it all well, all well, all the time. Right. And then we're not opening ourselves to you know, sharing with others our struggles and, and being um, imperfect. And, and that's really what I want the expectation to be is, is yeah, we, we are imperfect. We don't get it right all the time. And also, I think, too, with that whole self-improvement thing, which you admire in a young person, like a 15-year-old who's actually really trying to do all these things for his own um, health, and um, success in his in his studies and things um, is to say actually you're you're already good enough, and um, to keep saying that. And I think that one is really hard to understand and hear because we do know that there's a part of us that knows we can grow and improve, right? But it's got to be from a place of love and 
satisfaction with who you are um, versus, you know, like we talk about an, an empty cup and self-loathing and you're trying to change yourself. So I think that's so important. So those are the messages that I'm really trying to give him so, and and also just admiring the the work he's putting in and the effort and it's not about the result we really try and move away from that you know accolades around um you know the grades and things it's really about you know well done for putting the effort in mm. how do you walk that balance between you know the accolade or the focus on putting in the effort but then also of course we want to achieve results right like i, I think I, I understand you're right that the overemphasis of results can lead to a very very kind of um, jaded mentality but then i think it would be you know kind of besides the point to not also want to achieve results right like I, that's a very clear thing that we all uh, enjoy is when things actually work when something is pragmatically real how do you walk that balance in in that in that relationship if i may ask it's it's an it's an exciting question <laughs> yeah probably badly i'd say <laughs> you know again imperfectly i would walk that but i perfectly think that's the thing that yeah i i try to really take this approach as well uh, in the workplace too let's reverse engineer so th this is where you want to go and it was so helpful for me when i got some um parenting help when i was going through my burnout to understand you know why do we always say i'm going to become like i i when i become as a child like when i become we can start doing things we want to do today so you don't have to wait to become, um, for example, my son wants to be a filmmaker. He doesn't have to wait to become that. He can start watching right. movies today. He can start right. taking movies today. Like, we, you know, you don't have to, to wait. So I think that's the thing is, um, you know, how do you get to the A grade? It, it's not by looking at the A grade all the time. It's about consistently doing the behaviors every day that, that lead to an A grade. And more importantly for me, that lead to progress in yourself. Because you may not get to the A if you started at a D or whatever. It's about are you able to do the things consistently each day um, that, that make you feel good and um, help you um, progress along that. And that's why, for me, the behaviors are so important versus some of the values or the engagement indicators or even those OKIs and KPIs. Yes, we want to be working to them, but do we know how to get there? And are we doing the right things together? Are we constantly measuring, okay, we've gone off track. People think change is just this like big jump from A to B, but it's essentially a series of like failed experiments and successful ones. And we need to learn from the, the, the failed ones as much as we do the successful ones. So, um, you know, it's really about that goal being the the way we see are we getting there but but so much is it about um each day what are we doing in our behaviors because because we want to start today we don't want to have to be sort of intimidated by these long-term goals that that we don't feel like we've got progress towards or they just seem too big and too far away so mm, yeah very well said one, one step at the time uh, mm -hmm. starting in the here and now, right? Learning from success, but also learning from failure. Uh, Dr. Jacqueline Kerr, this was a fantastic conversation. We, we covered quite some, some ground, you know, thanks for sharing some personal stories and thanks for, you know, challenging even the language we use in, in this podcast together. I think this is, this is, um, you know, a, a beautiful way of continuously, uh, yeah, growing together in, in even those moments. And, um, it was such a pleasure to have you on and, um, you know, so again, so grateful for your wisdom and your research. Is there something else you'd like to share as we're as we're wrapping up this episode? Something you want to point at? Some of your work, where people can find you? No, thank you so much for this opportunity. And yes, I always learn from from these experiences um, as well. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. Yeah, people can find me on LinkedIn under Dr. Jacqueline Kerr or on my website at. Um, leadingrealchange.com that's leading hyphen real hyphen change.com thank you thank you